Let's get into it. Wild weekend. College basketball. St. John's upset UConn. Kentucky upset Tennessee. Oregon upset Arizona. Vanderbilt upset Arkansas. New Mexico upset San Diego State. We're going to get to some of that, perhaps all of that, before we're done. But I did want to start with Clemson. And that's because the Clemson Tigers improved to 7-0 in the ACC this weekend with a 72-64 win over Duke. Nobody else is better than 5-2 in the ACC, which means we are now 35% through the ACC schedule, and Clemson has at least a two-game lead over everybody else in the league, which means Clemson is now in position to win its first ACC regular season title since 1990. As I wrote in the preseason, when you are on the so-called hot seat and pick to finish 11th in your league, odds are you are about to to coach your last season at that school. That's what history tells us. Uh, and that's where Brad Brown found himself in the preseason. But now he's sitting alone atop the ACC standings. Dead leg, first question, are you ready to call Clemson the favorite in the ACC? Are you? No. <laughs> okay. But I'm willing to consider it. I'm willing to consider it for what uh, it's worth. Okay. For what it's worth, Ken Palm right now projects Clemson and Virginia to finish 15 and five in the ACC. That would be co ACC champions. After that, Pitt at 14 and six, Miami, North Carolina at 13 and seven, then Duke and NC State at 12 and eight. So, right now, according to Ken Palm, Clemson and Virginia should share the ACC title. I'm not ready to declare Clemson the favorite. Uh, the biggest reason is Clemson has played three road games against Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, and Pittsburgh. It has seven road games remaining. So still has to go on the road. Now it has to play Wake on the road, Florida State on the road, Boston College on the road, Louisville on the road, all manageable. The three toughest, and then we got to wait until we get there. Uh, it's got UNC, NC State, and then Virginia the last day of February. Hey, who knows? Maybe that game is is literally for first place once we, once we get there six or so weeks out. But we come to celebrate Clemson. And celebrate we will because life is short but sweet for certain. How about this? Clemson, 7-0 for the first time in, in program history. I mentioned on the previous pod, it had never been 6-0 until this year. And it's pulled that off. Um, right now, bona fide top 25 team. If you said it, GP, apologies. I didn't hear it off the top. And maybe people listening might have missed it. Did you indicate where Clemson is in your top 25 one? I did not. Uh, but okay. I did put Clemson in at number 25, one spot ahead of number 26, Duke. And I know that might sound low for a team on a seven game winning streak that is seven and zero in a power conference like the ACC, but I'll let you continue. And then I'll explain exactly what the problem is with Clemson's resume. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking to think if Clemson can win on the road Tuesday at wake, I'll put Clemson uh, by nature of just being one of the hottest teams in the country. Clemson will be in the top 15 of my power rankings. If it wins at wake on Tuesday, my power rankings refresh every Thursday right now, Clemson bona fide top 25 team. Here's where they are. I don't want to chop you off at your knees here, but I'll just get ahead of this in case you have some of this metric check-in as of Sunday for Clemson. Uh, better in re in resume metrics than predictive. So 20th in KPI, 25th in strength of record. So a top 25 team based off what they've done overall there. And predictive, 39th at Sagarin, 54th at Ken Palm, 61st at Torvik. So still more that needs to be proven there. Again, they got to go on the road a bit more and see what they can, they can do there. But getting to this point, Big time stuff. Brad Brownell has been able to get this team to 15 and three for the first time since 1718, that 1718 season. That team got a four seed and made the Sweet 16. It was also the most recent time that I could, I was trying to think back and I went back and looked at a few things. I'm pretty sure heading into 1718, Brownell was in the hot seat season. You got to make the tournament. You're going to lose your job. Now, had they not, who's to say if that actually, you know, absolutely would have happened, but it didn't happen. They made the tournament. He saved it this year as well completely of the understanding and impression that Clemson needed to make the NCAA tournament for Brownell, the winningest coach in program history uh, to maintain his job there. And he's certainly on pace to do that right now by going 15 and three. And I also checked earlier in the day on Saturday, I checked the 10 winningest seasons uh, in, in league play in Clemson history. And I, I checked where the, uh, the, the teams that were second, third, fourth in the ACC standings across, uh, you know, the decades where they, where they were at a given time in their schedule. And for the ACC, it was an eight-team league for a, a long time. Clemson is a founding member of the conference back dating back to 1953. I'm almost positive that right now, as we speak, Clemson's two-game lead in the ACC is the first time this has ever happened. By nature of Miami getting knocked off at NC State in OT on Saturday, 
It allowed Clemson with its win over Duke to get two games up in the loss column. So not just the first time ever 7-0 in conference play, but I don't think this program has at any point in its history ever enjoyed a two-game cushion in conference play. We're celebrating Clemson's one of the more surprising teams and stories in the sport so far this season wasn't projected to be an NCAA tournament team, wasn't projected to be even top 10 in the ACC. It was a preseason number 11 team. So good on them. PJ Hall was identified as a top five level player in the ACC. He did have a good game. I just like the way that Clemson showed up GP against Duke got a good fight from Duke. Kyle Filipowski continues to be a kind of a do everything guy and Tyrese Proctor's really coming around for the blue devils, but Clemson was not, wasn't, rattled really at all. I mean, Hunter Tyson, who had been playing well, didn't play too, too well, but PJ Hall, again, 26 points. Him and Brevin Galloway stood out there, and I we've seen this from Clemson before. Shouts to uh, OPP, Oliver Purnell, who at one point famously got Clemson to, I think, 17-0 and about 15 years ago. That team I still believe has the best record from a power conference team to then not make the NCAA tournament. So uh, there is that in its, in, in its history, but I do think Clemson is going to steady itself. It's done enough. I think it'll wind up making the tournament. I'm not going to say it's going to win the ACC GP. I'm not going to say this team for sure right now. I don't know if it'll be a four five or 60, but I think it's going to get in. And that's a big win for a program that needed to have a, a big time season. And here we are. No one saw this coming. They have taken advantage so far of a down ACC and they comfortably are sitting atop the standings. Longtime podcast listeners will remember that I named my middle son after Oliver Purnell. His name's Oliver Purnell Parrish. That's right. You mentioned Brad Brunell being on the hot seat. It, it would be interesting, worth starting a pot, worth worth an A block, if you will. Anytime an 11, a, a team picked to finish 11th in a power conference like the ACC is sitting here seven and zero with a two game cushion in the league standings on January 15th. It's especially interesting and worthy when the man coaching it is a hot seat coach. He is literally in the process of saving his job. If you believe the perception that his job was in jeopardy. And I think everybody entered this season under that impression. What's wild is just to go back and read what some people wrote in the preseason, myself included. I Googled real quick, like Brad Brunel, hot seat. And an article popped up and I clicked on it. And it was from 2014. This guy's been on the hot seat forever. He has. That might have been me. I remember one of the first ones I did for CBS, I put him on the hot seat. And they, they didn't do well and he didn't get fired. So The, he's, first, he's, the first time he ever appeared on a hot seat, best I can tell, was the 2014 season. We are now in the 2023 season, and he's seven and zero in the ACC with a two game cushion. So that, so that, that's phenomenal. We'll see where it goes, but that's uh, an awesome story. The reason you can't justify getting Clemson much higher than barely in the top 25 and one is because not only are the computer numbers shaky, as you pointed out, um, the resume is also weird. Clemson is four and one in quadrant one, two and oh in quadrant two. So six and one in the first two quadrants. That, that's terrific. No problem there. But they also have two quadrant four losses. They lost at South Carolina, which is ranked 269th in the net. Then hey, 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 mm-hmm. hey, hey. How dare you? That's what Shouts they did. To Shouts to Devin Downey. I know, but like, you know, I'm just, I'm just, these are facts. And lost to Loyola Chicago which is ranked 283rd in the net. That's very unusual for a team that's – I wonder if this has ever happened. A team is 7-0 in a power conference with two quad four losses. (laughs) I bet that's never happened. I I, I never say never, but to your point on the loyal of Chicago, just got in the A-10 – terrible this season. Hasn't won an A-10 game, 6-11. And it's not just that Clemson lost. Lost on a neutral – by 18 points to a terrible Loyola Chicago team. So you want to know why, if you've got, you know, we're 15 and three, why can't we climb up? It's because you got drilled <laughs> by a quad four opponent on a neutral floor and it wasn't even close. That will bring you down. You're going to have to continue to uh, subvert expectations from a metric standpoint to continue to rise and get inside the top 40. Where are you at, ESPN Stats and Info King Jared Burson? Where are you at, Andy Tulin? Somebody look that up. I bet you this is the first time. A power conference team has ever been 7-0 and in its league with two quadrant four losses on the resume. That's very rare for a ranked team at this point in the season to, or any point in the season to have two quad four losses. Um, like, I, I, as I noted, right now in the top 25 and one, you go through every team. Only one other team in the entire top 25 and one has even one quadrant four loss. And it's TCU. 
and it was more than two months ago, and it came, as we've discussed in a previous podcast, when two of TCU's top three scores were not available. That's the only other ranked team with one Quadrant 4 loss. So 24 of my 26 have zero Quadrant 4 losses. Then TCU has one, and Clemson has two. So that's the issue with the resume, but I just sort of decided – the 7-0 and ACC record has to be respected at some point, and I think, I think we finally reached the point after this weekend's win over Duke where that 7-0 and ACC record's got to be respected. Well, and I thought you might, and I didn't know where they were. I like to sometimes literally learn this from you on the pod so I can uh, have an organic reaction to it. But, you know, I, I know you probably had to shuffle a ton because, and we'll get to this, we'll, we're going to talk a lot about the weekend, but I'll, I, it warrants mentioning off the top in the Clemson segment here, and shouts to Andy Tulin for this. It was a historic day on Saturday. So I thought Clemson was going to be able to break in because there was just so much noise. 11 ranked teams fell Saturday and 13 total this weekend with a number next to their name lost. And that 11 on Saturday was the most we had ever had the most ranked teams losing in a single day since January of 2011. Now, Tennessee, Miami, Wisconsin, Arkansas, K-State, Providence, Missouri, Iowa State, Duke, Arizona, San Diego State were the 11 teams. Some of those teams obviously vulnerable to dropping out and will officially drop out in the AP Top 25 on Monday, let alone where GP would have had them going into the weekend there. But because we had that much um, commotion inside the AP Top 25, I mean, ranked teams went four and nine against unranked opponents this weekend. So it, w- it was a just OK weekend going in from a slate perspective. But then we got... You know, college football sometimes have this where you've got two or three notable games. and It's kind of like, well, it doesn't look like a great weekend. Then lo and behold, you got upsets happening on the hour. College basketball had some of that. And I thought that's why you would comfortably get Clemson in. I get the argument, though, that I put them 25 and kind of being hard to justify getting them higher. Because as a reminder, again, if you're kind of just tuning in midseason or if you've forgotten, as we move further along, I'm just going to speak for GP's rankings here uh, because <laughs> what the hell not. Parrish's rankings will more and more reflect resume accomplishments, so they will be more in line with bracketology projections. Totally viable and fair way to do it. And so on those grounds, on the face of that, Clemson right now just does not have a top 20 resume in the sport. You can't make a case for it. Right. Um, but like where Clem- and I do believe Clemson will likely break into the AP poll um, because I, I don't think or I, I'm not certain most AP voters even look at it as close as I look at it or care about quadrant four losses as much as I care about quadrant four losses. Like the, the loss column matters to me always just as much as the win column. And I'm not sure everybody ranking teams. I know fans don't look at it that way because uh, I'd say 98, 99 percent of fans who tweet me about a ranking. And, and, and they think their team's too low. They will never mention who their team has lost to. They will only mention, hey, we beat this team and this team and this team. Why are we down at 19? Well, because you also lost to this team, this team, and this team. Like, that matters. And so Clemson's loss column matters to me, but I'm not sure it'll matter as much as it um, perhaps should uh, to, to AP voters. And I would suspect Clemson will be in the top 25 poll when it updates on Monday. Either way, that's not the story. The story is that Clemson has a – an opportunity, a realistic chance now, according to the computers, according to your eyeballs, according to everything, to win a, at least a share of an ACC title for only the second time ever and the first time since 1990, which leads me to a trivia time. It's Let's trivia go. time. It's <laughs> trivia time. Turn your brain on. It's trivia time. Who coached right. Clemson to its first and only ACC title in 1990? Uh, give me, um, uh, hold on seeking. Uh, can't, can't cheat. I did. I, I'm I hope not. That, I'm seeking I hope mentally. That, hold on. I hope that's uh, understood that cheating is not allowed. Yeah, it's not. I'm, I'm not, I'm not literally seeking on my computer. People watching right now, right here. They can see, uh, come on, man. Coach at Coastal Carolina. I'm blanking. That's Cliff um, Ellis. You got it. That's right. Cliff Ellis. There we go. Thank you. Yes, Cliff Ellis. Cliff Ellis right. was the coach of that Clemson team. That team was led by Eldon Campbell and Dell Davis. They were the top two scorers. Both went on to play in the NBA. Next up for Clemson, got a road game at Wake Forest on Tuesday. So that'll be tough because Kimpom projects that as a 76-75 Wake Forest victory. So Clemson going to have to upset the Demon Deacons on Tuesday to remain unbeaten in the ACC. We'll talk about that one way or another on Wednesday.